Heaven, hell, time, space, dimensions, angels, demons, even the mystery religions all thrown at you at the very beginning as one big bang. That's what the book of Enoch is. I'm going to do my best to take you step by step through it. Buckle your seatbelts, boys and girls. This is how the book of Enoch starts. The book of Enoch. The words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he took up this parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, but for a remote one which is for to come. Now Enoch would be the seventh from Adam, or the great-grandfather of Noah. So if authentic, the book of Enoch would be actually one of the oldest texts. We don't have the original, but it would be one of the oldest pieces of writing, or the oldest piece of writing actually handed down to us. I've got Dave Carrico on the phone. Now Dave and his wife have spent decades, at least 20 years, studying uh, occult practices and ancient uh, rituals. In fact, psychologists, doctors use many of his books for the, uh, the drawings between uh, occult ritual abuse, ceremonial ritual abuse victims. Dave, if you're on the phone with me, can you tell me uh, your opinion of the Book of Enoch? Is it authentic or not authentic? Uh, my opinion of the Book of Enoch is a very high one. You cannot hold it to the level of scripture because the manuscript evidence for the book of Enoch wasn't preserved. But yet that book is extremely confirming of what we know in scripture. It is directly quoted in scripture in the book of Jude and it's alluded to in the book of Jude several other times. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Jude was Jesus' half-brother and also the fact that the Son of Man concept, which is the way Jesus referred to himself many times, also comes from the Book of Enoch. In those days I saw the head of days, when he seated himself upon the throne of his glory, and the books of the living were opened before him. And all his host, which is in heaven above, and his counselors, stood before him. And the hearts of the holy were filled with joy, because the number of the righteous had been offered. And at that hour the Son of Man was named in the presence of the Lord of Spirits, and his name before the head of days. Yea, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of the heaven were made, his name was named before the Lord of Spirits. He shall be a staff to the righteous, whereon to stay themselves and not fall. Now Dave, one of the things that really gets me on the book of Enoch is there are an eerie amount of things that happen to match up just right with historical events that happened as well as scientific things that he should not have known. We're going to go through those. But first, Dave, the book of Enoch starts with the insurrection of the angels. Literally, these things pouring in to our physical reality. Can you walk me through that? The book of Enoch gives us a precise account of the fall of the angels and their inbreeding with human beings. A fragment from the book of Noah. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. This is one of the most fantastic insights, and it's recorded in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6. And the book of Enoch gives us details. And this isn't anything that contradicts the word of God, but in my opinion, it gives us additional insight. And Simjaza was their leader, and said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, 
let us all swear an oath. And they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. So it looks here as if they taught mankind evil, lies, greed, war, battle with each other and the sword, every twisted thing in disharmony to the order that the Most High had made according to the text. And Enoch went and said, Azazel, thou shalt have no peace. A severe sentence has gone forth against thee to put thee in bonds, and thou shalt not have toleration, nor request granted to thee, because of the unrighteousness which thou hast taught, and because of all the works of godlessness and unrighteousness and sin which thou hast shown to men. Then I went and spoke to them all together, and they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them, and they besought me to draw up a petition for them, that they might find forgiveness, and to read their petition in the presence of the Lord of heaven. So let's recap this thing real fast. If I'm understanding correctly, these things, these beings, are, they're servants in dimensions of eternity well above us, and... God himself, the creator of everything, he decides he's going to birth children. And these servants are explained to, uh, you, you know, you're going to have to, you know, just like you serve me, you're going to have to serve my children. And <laughs> Lucifer, Lucifer, and the third of the angels, apparently, they, you know, we're not having, that ain't happening. Right? And so this creates a conflict. Boom! In the heavenlies. And these guys, they get subjugated. We really don't know how that, you know, how would we know how that works? But anyhow, they're, they're, they're to the side. And they make entrance to this place. Now, if I recollect the, the words of Jesus Christ, which are very critical, maybe here at this point. He says, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So the two are, are intertied in ways that we really don't understand. But we've made some kind of a choice at the beginning in the Garden of Eden story to give something entrance and dominion. And these things that came in, not only are they, you know, I mean, they're trucking in and not only are they saying, hey, you know, we're taking what we want here, but uh, but also, you know, we're in charge, and we're going to have our own kids. That's what they're doing. So not only do they hate you, these things want to be you. And Enoch, they, they run into some kind of problem with this. They're not able to zip in and out of wherever they, you know, however this used to work, where they could just seamlessly go in and out of somewhere. Suddenly they're running into a friction. And from henceforth, you shall not ascend into heaven unto all eternity. If I'm understanding this, and all of a sudden, hey, you know, Enoch, uh, notice, uh, notice you've got a good relationship with the Most High over there. I uh, think you could uh, put in a good word for us. <laughs> and here's Enoch. He actually, he actually does it. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go, bind Simjaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for seventy generations in the valleys of the earth, till the day of judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. But this is amazing. He's got the courage to march in to this whole group of these things that have now got their own offspring. And this is what he's going to tell them. Then I wrote out their petition and the prayer in regard to their spirits and their deeds individually. I wrote out your petition, and in my vision it appeared thus, that your petition will not be granted unto you throughout all the days of eternity. The flood came along and it wiped them all out. Now there are 277 official flood stories from cultures around the world, if I'm reading the numbers correctly. History Channel claims there's 2,000, but any way you cut it, there's a bunch of flood stories, all of them with a man surviving with his family on a boat of a global flood. Take that back, all of them except one. 
The Sumerians claim that their gods went up and came back down after the flood. Dave, you know anything about that? Yeah, what the Sumerians called the Anunnaki, in the word of God, they were called the Anankam. And these were another of the races of the giants that were the product of fallen angels cohabitating with human women. And until then I had been prostrate on my face, trembling, and the Lord called me with his own mouth and said to me, Come hither, Enoch, and hear my word. And one of the holy ones came to me and waked me, and he made me rise up and approach the door, and I bowed my face downwards. And he answered and said to me, and I heard his voice, Fear not, Enoch, thou righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach hither and hear my voice. And go, say to the watchers of heaven, who have sent thee to intercede for them, You should intercede for men, and not men for you. Wherefore have ye left the high, holy, and eternal heaven, and had lain with women, and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, and taken to yourselves wives, and done like the children of earth, and begotten giants as your sons? Now I'm reading from Numbers 13.33, which says, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which were of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers before them. And not coincidentally, but... Go declare to the watchers of heaven who have left the high heaven, the holy eternal place, and have taken unto themselves wives. Ye have wrought great destruction on the earth, and ye shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And inasmuch as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see. Following the exodus of Egypt, they were definitely, this group, the Hebrews, were definitely the underdogs, and favor would be on them nonetheless, leading, of course, the grand spectacle, giant battle sequence of David and Goliath, and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity. But mercy and peace shall ye not attain. And uh, then from there, Jesus Christ, who said amongst other things, Behold, I give you the power to tread on serpents. And for God so loved the world, God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that none should perish, but that all, in every race, creed, color, everybody on the face of the planet Earth. None should perish, but that all should have eternal life. But simultaneous to this, in the ancient world, it appears that there was somebody bopping around from place to place with a different message. They call them Chitari, children of the serpent. The royal kings of Africa claim descent from serpent gods who came from the sky. In South America, the Mayans teach that their ancestors were the people of the serpent. The Aztecs were said to be created by a serpent woman. So if I'm understanding our ancient records properly, after this flood, everybody spreads out and pyramids begin to rise all over the globe. In America, the Hopi Indians believe sky gods came to earth to breed with their women and refer to them as their snake brothers. The word Sioux means snakes, and Iroquois means serpents. Plants. A lot of these cultures even go darker than that into mass human sacrifice to their gods. And mind you, not only are they not telling these god stories like myths, but they're drawing hieroglyphic representations that are eerily similar to each other. And it's almost as if somebody was zipping back and forth and this was their message. We're in charge, and you can thank that to the snake. In Japan, emperors claim descent from dragon gods who came from the sky. Australian aborigines teach of a reptilian race which lives underneath the earth and governs over men. They believe they are descendants of a race of dragon humans. China teaches the serpent queen Nukua interbred with man. India calls these reptilian gods Nagas and claim they seated their royal families. Now I'm trying to think where 
in our most ancient texts, you'd find a shifty serpent-like thing talking people into stuff. Then I said, How beautiful is the tree, and how attractive to look at. Then Raphael, the holy angel who was with me, answered me and said to me, This is the tree of wisdom, of which thy father, old in years, and thy aged mother, who were before thee, have been eaten. What we see in ancient writings is a reflection of the biblical story. And of course, in the Word of God, we have that accurate and inspired record. And we can see this throughout all the cultures of the world. We see it in their belief in giants, in their belief in dragons, their, uh, the flood story in all of the cultures. And absolutely there's a connection because this was a worldwide reality. This isn't something that happened in a corner. It's a profound piece of the history of the human race. Special thanks to Dave Carrico as well as his wife Donna who have spent many, many, many years studying these topics from the ancient past all the way to present day to lay these materials in your hands like the book that's on your screen there. That's one of Dave's many books that deal with uh, ritual occult practices. Of course, their website is ritualabuse.org remember the org on the end ritualabuse.org all one word these folks put such diligence into every single part of the history and the content that goes in to those books please take the time to check them out now i'm on the phone with robert farrell and robert's done as far as i can tell he's the only guy on youtube to have uploaded and actually read the entire book of Enoch online, which had millions and millions and millions of views at this point. But more than that, Robert has actually studied these texts for more than 20 years. And now, my son Methuselah, all these things I am recounting to thee and writing down for thee. I have revealed to thee everything and given thee books concerning all these. So preserve, my son Methuselah, the books from thy father's hand, and see that thou deliver them to the generations of the world. But I have never run across anybody that just sees the different, I mean like, like someone's eye is looking at the words of a, of a Bible or an ancient text of any type really. In Robert's case, uh, uh, particularly, he, I mean, it just blew me away when I first talked to him about the Book of Enoch, but almost looking at these texts as if they're not only literal, but also every part of it uh, being keywords that that, uh, that interact with each other. Would that be a fair statement? Am I even describing it accurately, Robert? Well, you're, you're describing it, but that's really not the half of it. Everything in the Bible is parabolic. It isn't to say that it didn't happen in reality. Like, in fact, let me kind of give you a paradigm here. If you're looking at Jesus, for example, right, then what Jesus does as a man parallels what he does as the law does, right? In other words, if Jesus the man comes down and heals people's physical eyes, right, he, as the law does, comes down to heal men's spiritual eyes. If a person were to believe to this is what I'm getting at. If a person were to believe to you that Enoch was the seventh from Adam, but he did prophesy because his words were prophetic, if you did believe to you because uh, Peter, apparently the question is brought to Peter, hey, Jesus quoting all of this uh, apocryphal stuff. What do you think about that? But what should we tell people who ask us about it? Right? And Peter's thinking about it, and he knows that he's read the book of Enoch, just as Jude has. Jude's quoting Enoch 1 9. What's it say in Enoch 1 1 through 3? It says, The words of the blessing of Enoch were with the blessed, the elect, and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless sort of be removed. And he took up a parable, the parabolic, and said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens. The angel showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, so this generation is excluded, right? But for a remote one, and once again, just for you come, concerning the elect, I said, speak my parable concerning them. That book was never meant to be canonized, period. 
And Peter knew this. So just like I was telling you about the Ark of the Covenant the other day, you have this box of three covenants, and the book of Hebrews that tells you that there are three symbolic items in there. It's showing you the future in parables to be understood, of course, in retrospect. You know, because that was the way the Ark of the Covenant was laid out. There were three symbolic items, right? There was the table of the wall, there was Aaron's rod, which put it, and then there was the golden jar of hidden manna, right? A, a prefiguring of the fact that there are going to be three stages of revelation in God's Word. There was the table of the law, which corresponded to the Old Testament. Yeah. And then, Aaron's rod. Aaron was Moses' brother. Aaron was the Levitical high priest. He was the chief speaker of the two. Aaron's rod was the rod that was thrown down in front of the Egyptian magicians, and their rods turned into serpents, and his rod turned into a serpent and ate the other serpents. It was buried. When it was dug back up, it had budded or borne fruit. His rod represents Jesus Christ. His word, if you will, were hard to understand. There was a veil over people's eyes when they listened. That veil was the flesh because they saw it on the fleshly level. The jar of sweet manna represents when the Hebrews were in the desert, the manna would come for six days. And on the sixth day, they would have to collect, they would get a double portion for the day of rest that was coming. Here's, here's what it means, basically. Um, there is a time for us to not know the answer, and then there is a time for us to know the answer. Remember that Jesus, as the Logos, is railroaded um, by the religious authorities, yeah. and tried for the secular authorities, right? Tried before Pontius Pilate, who was the secular authority. The word Logos means the Word of God. In John 1 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down in 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this place, the very fabric matrix of this place, right, coming from a larger place, God himself became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what's being directly stated. This is why they had to get rid of those books. This is why they had to persecute the so-called heretics. Nobody who knew this stuff could be allowed to live and to pass it on. So the allegations against Jesus brought by his enemies were not only that he was healing people, that was their allegation, but that he was doing it on the wrong days. In all four accounts, and it's unheard of for any human being, especially during that time period where it's difficult even to have a piece of paper, he's covered from four different perspectives by four different men, and in all four accounts, he's resurrected from the dead. More than this, a man born, a physical body, born of no social class, is covered more than any king or human being that has ever lived or breathed or walked on the empires of this earth. See what I'm saying? People run around in the early church and they can tell you just what I'm telling you now. Now imagine the scenario. Wow. Guy, Wait a second. Take, let's let's say, say that again. Bottom line, the little bitty physical world is couched in this much larger spiritual reality. It's probably why it's called history, his story, and you're living a part of that. Here's what Enoch said. And again I saw with mine eyes as I slept, and I saw the heaven above, and behold, a star fell from heaven. The star that fell represents Lucifer, and in this vision Enoch is going to take you from the first generation of mankind to the very last. And behold, I saw many stars descend and cast themselves down from heaven to that first star. And they became bulls among those cattle, and they pastured with them. So the stars that followed represents the fallen angels, a portion of which made entrance to this place. And began to cover the cows of the oxen, and they all became pregnant and bare elephants camels and asses. They let out their privy members and the um, the bulls became pregnant, the elephants and the asses and these other things. These are the anomalies that the angels, the fallen angels, gave birth to. 
And I saw one of those four who had come forth first, and he seized that first star which had fallen from the heaven, and bound it hand and foot, and cast it into an abyss. And I was beholding in the vision, lo, one of those four who had come forth stoned them from heaven, and gathered and took all the great stars whose privy members were like those of horses, and bound them all hand and foot, and cast them into an abyss of the earth. So those fallen angels get yanked up by something stronger than them, and you could view this like uh, dimensions, right? And they get tossed into a place that is devoid off of this place, probably why they're still suctioning off of it, right? You decide what you let in and what you broadcast out, so they're still yelping from down there. And the water, the darkness, and mist increased upon it. And as I looked at the height of that water, that water had risen above the height of that enclosure, and was streaming over that enclosure, and it stood upon the earth. And all the cattle of that enclosure were gathered together, until I saw how they sank, and were swallowed up, and perished in that water. But that vessel floated on the water, while all the oxen and elephants and camels and asses sank to the bottom with all the animals, so that I could no longer see them, and they were not able to escape, but perished and sank into the depths. So that's the flood and the ark that takes everything down to zero, wipes them all out. Then the water began to run down into these till the earth became visible. But that vessel settled on the earth, and the darkness retired and light appeared. But that white bull which had become a man came out of that vessel, and the three bulls with him. That's Noah, the white bull, and his three baby bulls, so his three sons that go out from the ark. And one of those three was white like that bull, and one of them was red as blood, and one black, and that white bull departed from them. And they began to bring forth beasts in the field, and birds, so that there arose different generations, tigers, wolves, dogs, hyenas, wild boars, foxes, squirrels, swine, falcons, vultures, kites, eagles, and ravens. And then from the bulls, the sons of Noah, you have all of these different uh, cultures that spin off these different animal types. <laughs> And they began to bite one another, but that white bull which was born amongst them begat a wild ass, and white bull with it. Now from the mix of the mess of cultures and animals that came forth, you have another white bull that comes forth, that's Abraham. And the wild ass is multiplied, but that white bull which was born from him begat a black wild boar and a white sheep. And the former begat many boars, but that sheep begat twelve sheep. White bull, Abraham, goes Isaac, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, right? And he has 12 baby sheep, and those are the sons of Israel. And when those 12 sheep had grown, they gave up one of them to the asses, and those asses again gave up that sheep to the wolves. And that sheep grew up among the wolves. And the Lord brought the eleven sheep to live with it, and to pasture with it among the wolves. And they multiplied, and became many flocks of sheep. That text is so awesome. If we were to keep reading, it would take us straight through Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Lord of the sheep, the one for whom salvation comes not only to the righteous before his coming, but also all those afterwards and the spirit of those who have fallen asleep in righteousness. And he shall judge the secret things, and none shall be able to utter a lying word before him. For he is the elect one before the Lord of spirits, yet through his name they shall be saved. Ultimately, leading to the end when all of the different wild animals and things that are running loose, those that sought righteousness, the elect, uh, all become white bulls before the Holy of Holies, the Most High. Special thanks to Robert Farrell for reading that entire text online. And in those days shall the mountains leap like rams, and the hills also shall skip like rams satisfied with milk, and the faces of all the angels in heaven shall be lighted up with joy, and the earth shall rejoice. Robert 
actually his uh, his backstory is he he used to actually be an atheist until he got a hold of some of these ancient documents and was looking at them. His website is scriptural truth.com so that's scriptural with a dash truth.com please go over and check him out i've got on the phone with me dr walt brown dr walt brown is the author of the book in the beginning this is a literal textbook just page after page after page of illustrated sciences sold hundreds of thousands of copies of this book but more than that walt brown has spent about 40 years maybe more than this of his life studying the flood account Walt uh, Dr. Walt Brown I guess the question on my mind would be is Noah's flood real that is correct uh, one one humorous kind of example the Chinese ancient Chinese language the classical Chinese language right uh, as a uh, is, is built out of pictographs little little symbols that when you piece them together, it tells a story. Sure, like hieroglyphs. The story gives a word. Well, the, the Chinese word for boat, and I have a picture in my book. You can use it if you like. The Chinese word for boat is composed of, of three symbols. Eight, people or mouths. <laughs> and this, this classical Chinese language is, is goes back uh, thousands of years. We can see on our planet 17 very strange features which can now be systematically explained as a result of a cataclysmic global flood whose waters erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 10 billion hydrogen bombs. This explanation shows us just how rapidly major mountains formed. It explains the coal and oil deposits, the rapid continental drift, why on the ocean floor there are huge trenches and hundreds of canyons and volcanoes. It explains the formation of the layered strata and most of the fossils, the frozen mammoths, and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. Increasing pressure in the subterranean water stretched the crust just as a balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack which grew in both directions at about three miles per second. The crack, following the path of least resistance, encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the earth, the overlying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight of the 10 miles of rock pressing down on it. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. All along this globe encircling rupture, fountains of water jetted supersonically almost 20 miles into the atmosphere. The high pressure fountains eroded the rock on both sides of the crack, producing huge volumes of sediments that settled out of this muddy water all over the earth. These sediments trapped and buried plants and animals. This erosion widened the rupture. Eventually, the width was so great that the compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth like the seam of a baseball and buckled. The portions of the hydroplate that buckled down formed ocean trenches. Those that buckled upward formed mountains. This is why the major mountain chains are parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. That's called hydroplate theory that he was just discussing there. And at first, when that was proposed uh, 15, 20 years ago to the scientific geological community, they were very resistant. Well, it disagreed with uh, the models that they they you know had already given a thumbs up but it is true it does appear to be true that there have been discovery after discovery as faith and coincidence would have it that might tend to favor dr brown's hydroplate uh, Having served as director of one of the United States Defense Department's major research and development laboratories, Dr. Walter Brown comes with an impressive list of credentials. This is the question that stops most scientific investigators dead in their tracks. Yet the hydroplate theory makes the answer obvious. As the hydroplates crashed, they thickened and rose out of the water, forcing the floodwaters over the continents to recede. Simultaneously, upward surging subterranean water was choked off. 
As the flood water drained off the continents, every continental basin was left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. Scientists are also scratching their heads over another recent discovery. On the Kola Peninsula in northern Russia, they have created the world's deepest hole, extending to a depth of 7.5 miles. At this depth, what they expected to find was a layer of basalt, Earth's most common type of volcanic rock. What they actually discovered was something entirely different. The hole didn't reach the basalt underlying the granite continents, but to everyone's surprise, they did reach hot, salty water flowing through crushed granite. Special thanks to Dr. Walt Brown, who took a few minutes of his time to talk to me. It was very much an honor. I've actually owned two copies of his book, In the Beginning, and would highly recommend it. The thing is fantastic. Pretty certain that you're going to agree that I saved the very best for last in this video. I wouldn't have it any other way than to end this God in a nutshell with the words from the ancient texts of the Book of Enoch. And after some days, my son Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamech, and she became pregnant by him and bore a son. And his body was white as snow, and red as the blooming of a rose. And the hair of his head and his long locks were white as wool, and his eyes beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, he lighted up the whole house like the sun. And the whole house was very bright. And thereupon he arose in the hands of the midwife, opened his mouth, and conversed with the Lord of Righteousness. And his father Lamech was afraid of him, and fled, and came to his father Methuselah. And he said unto him, I have begotten a strange son, diverse from and unlike man, and resembling the sons of God in heaven. And his nature is different, and he is not like us. And behold, I have come to thee, that thou mayest make known to me the truth. And I, Enoch, answered and said to him, The Lord will do a new thing on the earth, and this I have already seen in a vision. Yea, there shall come a great destruction over the whole earth, and there shall be a deluge. And this son who has been born unto you shall be left on the earth, and his three children shall be saved with him. When all mankind that are on the earth shall die, he and his son shall be saved. And now make known to thy son Lamech that he who has been born to him is in truth his son, and call his name Noah. I told you it ended good. Update on the Theory of Everything book. I'm trying to have that ready in time for Christmas 2012. Of course, before then, uh, Book Thieves is available. The true story of the time when I committed a safe robbery on the television pastor Mike Murdoch in 1999. Grand Testament to the fact that uh, people can change. What? Don't look at me like that. Like you're a perfect angel. <laughs> Tuck some clips in the back of this video about that embarrassing time period in my life and the safe robbery of the television pastor as well as if you look down there on the bottom of your screen that little logo nutshell news if you're a writer or a blogger or somebody that just likes posting stuff online go over to that website and click the submit content button become a writer for nutshell news Whew. thanks for coming with me on that ride guys <laughs> that was the book of Enoch Here's your clips. This is Trey Smith of the God in a Nutshell Project. If you thought that video was good, you may want to subscribe to this channel. Tucked a couple of clips in the back of this video. I think you're going to like them. Papa. I'd like to show you this. This is the theory of everything. It's actually the cover for the, uh, the book that's going to come out. This will be the next one. Taos will not be the next one out. It'll be this book here. And every page of this thing, called The Theory of Everything, high definition graphics, just beautifully laid out. I mean, it, not only would it look great on a coffee table, but it's actually, just like all my stuff, it's got, it's got some twists in there. Now, according to thermodynamics and physics, by any natural cause, this whole place should be one enormous superposition of randomness and nothing definite ever happening yet it's completely the reverse of that 
I mean, this is so the reverse of that, that it's almost like the universe itself is this enormous Swiss watch of mechanics that you really don't even understand only the tip of the iceberg of you winning the lottery every single day, not missing once, for the next thousand years does not even scratch the surface of the statistical odds of one single cell of this place. How does that happen on its own? Now this gets more intense. This whole place is made of little bitty machines all doing things. The receptors send messenger molecules to the enzymes and organelles crowding the cell. Some messages reach a network of tubes called the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, if you took every piece of technology that we've ever made and packed it into a space so small that you can barely see it with our largest microscopes, you would still be light years away from the technology employed in a single cell. So here we are, the unusual little blue rock called Earth in an enormous black abyss called space. Anybody else find that kind of strange? And when you dive deep enough into the very fabric nature of this place, time, space, all of it dissolves into little particle pixels in a three-dimensional space. In fact, the physics guys might tell you that reality is an illusion. It is true that smaller things tend to come from bigger things. Don't worry, I got you on this one. Each one being infinity itself. And infinity is the number without numbers. And this whole place, everything here is interdependent. Everything here is connected to everything else. These are called prerequisites. Let me ask you this. What is consciousness? It's got to be a little bit more going on in there than uh, just some little electrical charges going back and forth and some biochemistry, right? Something completely intangible controlling something very tangible from the fingertips to the toes to the tongue and every part in between. Place where what's above translates into what's below, huh? So I might propose that. It's the spot where two dimensions meet. The ghost in the machine. Boom. Here's my favorite part and it's just like a precious gem. You know, they'll get to, they'll make these grand computer models of things and then there'll be all this calamity that it works on the computer screen. <laughs> it doesn't work in practical application. It's funny though. It's the part that'll really kick you. You plug the past into the present. The science lights up. In the book, I think you're going to have a great time looking at the, uh, the images perspectives in it. And I've got one more thing to show you. Here's the clip. I was able to buy a beautiful Cessna Citation jet, cash. A few months later, bought another jet worth three times what that one was. A little bit later, bought a third jet. Bought them all three. Now that's Mike Murdoch, roughly $25 million a year guy and scheming buddy of Benny Hinn. I want to love and be loved. Now this isn't all just jet planes and really hot looking women. I've been single 30 years. God himself yeah, it's not good for men to says, be I yeah. am not enough for Adam. Yep. He needs a woman. God doesn't mind you experimenting and exploring. He understands that. The Bible said he knew we were but flesh. Let me assure you, none of us are units. <laughs> This is a look at what his home looks like. Now this is the exact spot on the mansion property where I smashed a Cadillac through Mike Murdoch's gate in 1999. I want you to become a faith partner. This is 12 months, 12 months. I'm not talking about just sending a little extra check. 
Mike Murdoch was the darkest dude with his own empire that I ever met in my whole life. I'm talking about you entering into a covenant, a covenant, a covenant for 12 months. Give God four seasons. It was at the moment of that safe robbery that everything changed in my life forever. But to even get to this place called Hacienda de Paz, the house you see on your screen there, you've got to know where it is. It's buried in trees and these willows. You've got to go down this kind of very private, secluded road over an English style, this little sort of English style bridge looking thing, and make it to this very large gate. So here we are at the most pristine Christian school on the planet Earth. The days start blending with nights because of all the nightclubs and sometimes enough narcotics to kill a horse. Jason's working at a topless bar. It got intense. Say that again. The only thing that pleasures God is the thousand dollars. I want you to become a faith partner. This is 12 months. 12 months. Just call us and say you can expect my seat of a thousand. Thank you. I'm not talking about just sending a little extra check. I decree that you become one of 3,000. I'm talking about you entering into a covenant. A covenant. A covenant for 12 months. New covenant partners. Give God four seasons. I said get back, you filthy beast. Get him back in there. Get back. Wow. I wrote a little song for you. How dumb thou art. <laughs> He said that song's a joke, but I kind of think he means it. Thieves by Trey Smith. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere books are sold. I've been on radio and TV for 20 years. And Trey, first, as far as the book itself, I'll give you an example. My producer, Will Duffy, his wife, Danielle, was in the hospital to give birth. And they had some time, so Will is reading aloud thieves and not only his wife becomes addicted to it but people in neighboring beds and neighboring rooms all sat in to listen to thieves being read it's like danielle wanted to delay labor because she was so fascinated thieves was me pouring literally my heart out day after day these were all written in a jail cell and guards used to pay me when they were on shift. They would give me extra lunch trays to read them this book. So Thieves was originally paid for with jailhouse lunch trays. And then, after the safe robbery, when I'm on the run from a television pastor in Mexico, it really kicks into high octane. Sometimes I would just stop and say to myself, there's not a lot of really great ways for any of this to end. Crazy as it seems, though, it did all end well. I promise. Thank God for that. I'm pretty certain that you're not going to find anything like this anywhere. God spoke to me a few minutes ago. There's someone who has back tithe, and you have never been caught up. It may be a house you sold or some land, and this is the season to write the seed. And bless me beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs> okay, okay. Trace my thieves. I'm getting a copy. Okay, enough. I wanted to tack a note onto the end of this video and state to you that that book, Thieves, from start to finish, no matter how fun it might be to read, does not in any way represent who I am today. And more than that, I've not only asked forgiveness in my own heart, but from a great many parties uh, who are in that book and who are not in that book that I needed to ask for forgiveness from. More than that, I'd like to give a special thank you to ministries, men and women of faith, churches and organizations all across this United States because they are not represented. The hearts of the people are not represented by the few that are just take, 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 take. I have seen so many, both great and small ministries, who no matter who they are, they would give you the last shirt off of their back. And I want to thank them. I'm Trey Smith. God bless every one of you.